Thank you once again for joining me today on Side by Side. And I hope this will encourage you again today as we travel on with our boots on through Paul's epistle to the Romans. We were thinking yesterday about the inner and the outer. You know, external works do not really do it. We need a change of our heart. And that last verse of chapter 2 says, A person with a changed heart seeks praise from God and not from people. And then there is this kind of anticipation by Paul where he anticipates that someone there listening to him has a question. And that's what he does as he goes through this little epistle. He raises the question. He doesn't answer it completely. He will answer this question and these questions he's dealing with in chapters 9, 10, and 11 in much more depth. But he just, he fires in this question. Then, what's the advantage of being a Jew? Is there any value in the ceremony of circumcision? So this question arises, what's the benefit of this? Are we really any better off than anyone else? And just, we've got this great history, but does it mean anything? And then Paul says, Yes, there are great benefits. First of all, the Jews were entrusted with the whole revelation of God. I was thinking about this, and this has not been an easy section, and I've sort of gone back and forwards through it. And it brings us to the place where Paul wants to expose and show people that everyone, Jew and Gentile, received the greatest blessings through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he will come to that at the end of chapter 3, where he talks about that God has now shown us a way to be made right with him, without keeping the requirements of the law. And so that's where he's heading, but he's got to take the Jewish community along with him. And so he speaks about the, the facing up honestly to, to these questions. He wants to try and help people understand that guilt is a universal thing. He said that you've had this great privilege, the revelation of God. God gave you the scriptures or the oracles of God is how they're described. And even though some of the Jews were unfaithful, that doesn't mean to say that God was not faithful to keep his promises within them. And then there are some and they say, well, oh, you mean then that if they were unfaithful, it shows God out to be even more faithful? Does that mean then that we should do bad so that God will look good? In other words, that the the, the ends justifies the means? He said, no, no. He said, what then are we to conclude? That Jews are better than others? No, not at all, he says. For we have already shown that all people, whether Jews or Gentiles, are under the power of sin. I think it's important to focus on that word, under the power of sin. Sin is many things. Sin is a natural inclination of the human heart. We have a deviation towards doing that which is wrong. But sin is also a power. In other words, it's like a, a power over you. It's like a, a slave driver. People become enslaved to it. And that's why we need to be delivered from its power. And that's what happens when people come to Jesus Christ. They are delivered from its power. Like he releases them, having paid the price for that. But then he goes on to say, no, 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 he says, for we're all, we, we have already shown that all people are under the power of sin. And then he lists... A piece of scripture which, when people read it, sometimes they think they think it's all from one specific text, but it's not. It's six different verses taken from the Psalms mostly, and one from Isaiah, and one from Proverbs. He puts them together in a compilation way, which really sort of adds to no one is righteous, no one is truly wise, all have turned away, no one does good. Their talk is far, their tongues are filled with lies, their mouths are full of cursing, they rush to commit murder. Little by little by little, it ends up by saying they have no fear of God. He said, the end result is that everyone is shown to be guilty. I must say, one of the books, apart from the Bible that I have read, that has brought the greatest blessing to me, is a book called The Cross of Christ by John Stott. And I turn to that to give you a few little quotations this morning to help you figure out some of these thoughts about sin. Because this book of John Stott's, which I would reckon must be among the 10 best sellers of all times, and if you've never read it or you don't have it, I would really recommend you, you get a copy. You can buy it secondhand for, I imagine, very little money, but I would say it's worth spending whatever it takes to get it. He writes so simply, so clearly, 
and just take your time going through it. Let me quote from what he says in the question of true and false guilt. He says, an eloquent spokesman of this viewpoint is the BBC's former religious affairs correspondent, Gerald Priestland. One of his talks in the radio series, Priestland's Progress, was entitled Guilt-Edged Religion. And he told us how at the age of 10 he thought Christianity was about sin, and that by the time he was 15, having glimpses into the abyss of depression, accompanied by fears of divine vengeance for his unnameable secret crimes, fears which kept growing for the next 30 years. His Christianity gave him no help. When I looked at the cross with the suffering victim, its only message to me was, you did this and there's no health in you. His equivalent of a Damascus Road conversion came to him at last on the psychiatrist's couch, for that was where he learnt the missing element of forgiveness. Since then, he confesses to a fairly low level of personal guilt and relatively little interest in the matter of sin. Now, he says that's not all the story, but let me quote from Stott. He says, how could anyone imagine that Christianity is about sin rather than about the forgiveness of sin? How could anyone look on the cross and see only the shame of what it did to Christ rather than the glory of what he did for us? The prodigal son had to come to himself, acknowledging his sin, his self-centeredness, before he could come to his father. A guilty conscience is a great blessing, but only if it drives us home. I, I continue to quote a little bit here and there from Stott. He says, if there, For if there is false guilt, feeling bad about evil we have not done, there is also false innocence, feeling good about the evil we have done. If false contrition is unhealthy, an ungrounded weeping over guilt, so is false assurance, an ungrounded rejoicing over forgiveness. It may be, therefore, that it's not we who exaggerate when we stress the seriousness of sin, but our critics who underestimate it. Just so long as we deny the reality of sin, we cut ourselves off from the possibility of radical redemption. I just think the idea of getting that health check, we were talking about uh, the health check is so crucial. Understanding the seriousness of our condition is the only way in which we will then accept the radical treatment that is required, or any treatment at all for that matter. The Bible clearly states that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Paul tries to explain this to the Jewish mind, who thinks he's okay because he has the law, and he, I think, does a very good job in, in, in his arguments. The law shows us how sinful we are. We have all fallen short of God's standard, the standard that says to love him with all of our hearts. Note again the heart, our minds, our strength and our souls, and to love our neighbour as ourselves. None of us have done that. In fact, even now, for those of us who know the forgiveness of the Lord, who rest in the work of Jesus Christ, we still know that we don't love God with all our hearts souls, minds and strength, or our neighbours as ourselves. But I suppose we know that we haven't, and that is the, the big thing. And we know that there is one who daily will cover our sin for us, the Lord Jesus Christ. So as we think about this question of sin, it's not a morbid subject. It's an important subject. And it's a subject that is at the centre of God's word it's at the centre of our own Christian worldview. We mentioned that there's creation and then there's fall. And then there's sin, of course, that follows from that, day by day. But then there's redemption and finally glory. So as you and I face the reality of our own sinful natures every day, that resistance to do the right, that willingness to do the wrong, isn't it great to know that there is an answer and that we are forgiven in Christ? And even though you and I will not be perfect today, we are being perfected little by little by the work of the Spirit. And one day we will be completely perfect, free not just from the power of sin, but free from the very presence of sin. That's what heaven will be like for you and I.
and for all those who are there. So I hope these few thoughts will help you as you negotiate your day. And we look forward to tomorrow when we'll try to travel a little further through this challenging little epistle. And the Lord bless you.